Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard their point. Now, hear the counterpoint on Libertarian Counterpoint Podcasts. Uh, thank you, those okay. of you who uh, watch the regular show for watching uh, uh, some Libertarian uh, Counterpoint uh, podcast. And you can catch uh, our past shows on Facebook's uh, Libertarian Counterpoint uh, Facebook page, uh, <clears throat> among other places. Uh, so we'll give it a uh, thanks again for attending. Okay. So we are now into the overtime session of uh, our uh, July 31st uh, show on 2020. And uh, we had a question from Scott Schmidt. Uh, according to Keynesian economics, spending is increased during the downturn and taxes are raised during a good time. <clears throat> um, so uh, obviously, I mean, we've heard the debates many times between, you know, uh, people like Friedman talking about, you know, the idea with Keynes, you know, the idea is to spend more, you know, in bad times to, to juice the economy and get it back up and running. And then in the good times sort of pull back and, and, uh, you know, sort of pay like for your spending. Sure. Yeah. yeah, pay for the spending. Pay for your spending and, back in the exactly. back in the bad times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Keep, you know, keep the inflation from happening. All that kind of stuff. So, so, uh, anyways, uh, but uh, that's that's kind of the ideal on the Keynesian stuff. Uh, do you guys want to jump in on that? Uh, uh, talk with about all, sure. All with, all, with all due respect, with all due respect to Scott, I'm just going to say it as plainly as I can. Keynesian economics have been totally discredited. It's not anything we should be teaching anywhere in the United States or in any school of economics. It has been totally discredited. There's nothing more to be said about this. There's a whole body of literature that this economics, this theory, as it is still called, have been totally discredited. There's a whole body of literature on this. All right. It's been, okay. Um, uh, yeah, thank, thank, thanks for Scott. Um, I love Scott. I'm glad Scott <laughs> asked the questions. <laughs> and he is correct. Yeah, the, the Keynesian theory uh, is it's all about aggregate demand. So if demand is down during the bad times, the government spends to keep aggregate demand up. They spend on whatever they want to spend on, whatever that might be. Uh, and then during the down, then once things, uh, the economy is, uh, picks back up for whatever reasons that it picks back up, then uh, they go ahead and start taxing. Um, so drawing money out of the economy because now you got some money to draw from and you're going to pay uh, whatever. They never pay the debts that they occur, that occur during, uh, you know, so if they're spending and they have less tax revenue, they spending during the bad times, it's usually with debt. Uh, and nowadays it's a hundred percent, a hundred percent with debt. Why do I say a hundred percent? Because we can't even pay for the things without extra spending, without goosing the economy. We can't even afford that without deficits and haven't for decades, decades. So <clears throat> that leaves us with more debt and, and, and they never, I mean, show me where they actually paid the debt down, the government, the federal government especially. And um, they had a time when the deficit went down under Clinton, but that was just the deficit. In other words, the shortage went down a little bit under, under Clinton. Sure, but that's not the same as paying down the debt. They paid zero on the debt that existed prior to that. Yes, they ran up a little less debt than they did under um, other previous presidents prior to Clinton, but that's not the same thing. Okay, um, so it's all about aggregate. Well, you know, Tim, Tim, while you're talking, I'm gonna throw up a visual. Just keep on talking, but I, I, I have a graphic that at least shows some of what you're talking about, you know, so. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so it's just about aggregate, um, aggregate, they're trying to, to keep the, the total total demand up, okay, in aggregate. In other words, it just doesn't matter if uh, you uh, buy a couple more F-22s or F-35s, you know, or, or if you um, uh, pay somebody to dig a hole and then pay them to fill it back up. None of that matters to the Keynesians. But to 
people that have sound economic philosophy. What matters is what drives the economy forward by people where people will take risks. I don't see your graphic, but where people will take risks and actually invest in in new products and services. And so, um, yeah, so there's your federal debt. And World War II got goosed. Um, yeah, interest. Your graphic is gone. Oh, they, oh sorry. There you go. Okay. Comes and goes. <laughs> Yeah, there's our federal debt. And uh, so, yeah, it went up in World War II. Um, they increased taxes something like 30% to pay for that war, and it wasn't enough. And so they went to the American public. And they didn't do what they do today, going, hey, don't you worry, Uncle Sam's going to take care of you. No, instead, they said, hey, we, we can't pay enough, even with our 30% increase in federal income tax, so we're going to have to ask you to buy bonds, war bonds, to fund the war effort. So what did Americans do? They got together and they, they scrimped and saved and they bought war bonds, which are, is government debt. So the debt, total debt, was actually quite low after, right after World War II. And the majority of the total debt, in other words, business debt, personal debt, and government debt, was maintained by the government because they went into so much debt for World War II. So uh, when it came time to pay that debt back, there was uh, uh, not much demand for credit in the credit markets because people were out of debt and they had a lot of savings. Even I mean, the savings rate was, uh, what was it? It was something like 40% or 20%, I can't recall. But right prior to that, because people didn't have anything to spend money on. They were all they were in the war effort and they they cut way back. You know, it was kind of like today, only today we we have to the government is just taking care of everybody. Instead, back then, it was um, the uh, the people taking care of the government. In other words, funding their um, their war. So anyway, that that's kind of all I had to say about about the whole Keynesian thing. It's just a disaster. It's always been a disaster and never will be anything except a disaster. And until people, you know, the governments realize they they really are better off paying as you go instead of this debt, debt and <laughs> look at that mountain of debt. We're, yeah. we're never going to get out of this. Well, you know, there, there's a couple of things I wanted to jump in and add to uh, one just for clarity. So this was a, a graph that was published by the CBO in 2019. That's a congressional budget office. So that's where we're getting this from. And uh, it, it was published in 2019. And of course, there's been a lot of changes since 2019. <laughs> so uh, we're a little bit uh, steeper up on that curve where they yeah. show the, the, the line there, actual, where it says actual up in the, uh, yeah, I don't know if you can see my pointer there, but um, yep. where it says actual, that's that line down there. That was essentially when this graph was generated. And now we're actually at the level of around where it says World War II <laughs> on that curve. So, you know, it was projecting back then that that was going to happen around 2030, 2035. And we're actually approaching those levels right now with all of the yeah. debt spending that we're going into. And... Um, Another thing about the Keynesian, uh, uh, I guess, uh, idea on this uh, is that, you know, it's in a theory, theory. Yeah, in theory, it sounds like a good idea. I mean, you know, okay, well, you know, gosh, you're, you got a smart guy at the controls and, you know, gosh, it needs a little bit here. You give it a little, you know, and then it, you're going a little bit too far there. You kind of rein it in. But in reality, the incentive for a politician is never to be the guy who's reining it in. <laughs> <laughs> and they never, they, they never do. They never do. So, so the incentive for any politician is to always spend more. And the public isn't, you know, generally educated about this stuff. They're just going to vote for the guy who continues to promise more. And so, even if that model worked, uh, you know, it, you know, in in theory, it's never actually going to work in practice because <clears throat> you always have the the problem that the. The, uh, you know, the politician has the wrong incentives uh, to, to make the Keynesian model work. That said, oh, you mean he, he may he may uh, fund a, uh, uh, a constituent's pet project that no one else wants. Yeah. He might do oh, that. 
Like yeah, production. which 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 they always do, which they always do. I mean, government yeah. spending is yeah. just buying votes in, in, in through law. That's all it is. Is buying votes through law. And this Keynesian theory, the biggest proponent of Keynesian economics in America today is, is Paul Krugman, who never gets anything right. And, <laughs> and, and he's still he still he still he still um 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 supported and 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 uh, and and always talking about his glories. But that that brings up the second flaw in the theory, I think, and that's that there is a smart guy at the center of everything making the decisions of how to spend this this uh, you know government you know uh, redirected money, uh, redirected yeah. funds. I mean, uh, part of the problem with central planning over a market economy mm -hmm. is the market economy is essentially has a wealth of bottom up mm -hmm. information. I mean, it's all price signals going back and forth mm -hmm. from the people who are offering products and the people who want products. And that's kind of what's telling everybody in real time always, you know, sort of where the resources should be going, you know, and how we should be redirecting things. But in a, in a central planning aspect, you literally have one guy who's trying to divine what's the best use of resources for everybody else. And so you have this bottleneck of information that occurs in, in top down central planning. And so, you know, when you when you move to that Keynesian model where you're saying, okay, well, let's take resources from one area and give them to another, you run into that problem with the Keynesian model as well. Is it is the guy a smart guy who's in and even if he was a smart guy, nobody can have nobody the, can know. You know exactly the, the information no. to really yeah. know what the best use of all those, you know, that infinite wealth of information that comes from bottom up, you know, market market scenarios but these yeah, these Keynesian these Keynesian economists never realize it's it is those market sigma signals normally through the price that's that causes goods and services to be efficiently allocated you know one of the big examples of this central planning nonsense that go that go on in this world that we we ever had that should be the most stark lesson for us Mikhail Gorbachev who used to head the Soviet Union before it, it dissolved he was the last, he was the last um, head of the Soviet Union. He told Margaret Thatcher that the Soviet Union produces enough food to feed, it, to feed its people, but one third of it rots before it gets to market. Now we think about that. And they always end up importing because they, they, they were never able to, to, to produce enough. But they, they were producing enough, according to Gorbachev. They were producing. But they could not get it to the people because the central planners are there telling, oh, this smart guy could figure out, oh, this should go to X and that should go to Y and that should go to Z, and he never get it right, just like Paul Krugman. You know, yet yet another problem with the whole central planning aspect of things too, and you know, we think we're jumping in heavy on central planning here, but but the uh, the, the the part of the issue is the coarseness too. I mean. When we are looking at information with respect to the bottom-up information of markets and price signals, essentially you're voting every time with your dollars on what your perspective is on where those resources should be. So, you know, right. if you prefer a red hat, your money goes towards red hats. You know, if you prefer chocolate ice cream over vanilla, then your money goes towards chocolate ice cream instead yes. of you know, cakes or whatever it is. But the, the, the central planner, he can generally only go with polls and votes, and that only occurs you know, uh, very coarsely a few times a year at best. So you're Don't only forget bribes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bribes. Okay, that, that actually happens pretty con consistently. <laughs> but but uh, but aside from, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, concentrated interest bribes. Yeah, you, you've still got the, the problem. Even if we were run by angels and everybody was operating the way you should, you're still getting this information that's trickling into government just in bits and pieces, you know, a vote a yes. couple times a year or something versus voting every time with your dollars. You know, it's just that there's no comparison, though. The information is, is just like, you know, uh, it working with a stick in the sand on your math versus using, you know, your, you know, essentially your Excel spreadsheet. I mean, it's, just, it's no comparison. Well, oh. I mean, who whoever 20 years ago knew that they were going to, be needing and using touch screens as much as we do today. Exactly. Who who knew? Who, they yep. they were just being brought out. I can't remember. Just about to be when um, the iPhone came out, and now look at us. We're, we have touch screens all over the place and all exactly. kinds of things yes. that, that we use. And um, so, what central planner would have thought up 
touchscreen technology. Yeah. But I tell you what, we we know which central planner uh, thought that the internet would be no better than the fax machine as far as the impact. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, the internet's not going to go the way of the fax machine. You just watch. And I'm Paul Krugman, and uh, I, I approve this message. <laughs> yeah, well, like I, like I said, like I said, you know, Paul Krugman is just like the government. They never get anything right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I think maybe we put that to rest. I, I don't know. Uh, if we don't have any more comments. Do you guys have any more you wanted to pile on here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I'm done piling. I think. I think we got it right. I think we got it right. Uh, well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Scott, though. Yeah, yeah, th yeah Scott, Scott you have given us some good questions these last two shows. So I think we have, we have to thank him for those. Yes, yes indeed, indeed. 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 Thank you. Yes, thanks again, Scott, for that comment and listening. And thanks also to all of other listeners. And, uh, you know, like I said, you can join us at uh, uh, our Facebook page on Libertarian Counterpoint and uh, catch our past shows on there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Uh, so thank you.